I'm gonna go a little bit slower so you can follow, hopefully. But if you couldn't, I'm recording my screen. You can follow later. I already defined some stuff here, and I'm gonna go through each other. So uh, I also remove the hand to make it more simple to uh, simulate. We're gonna remove more stuff before simulation because you don't need all this stuff to be meshed for a simulation. Our focus is on the pin now in this one. And uh, <clears throat> as you have seen, you have a very similar one here in the excavator. No matter what pin you have, like in the top, you have this one or here or the main boom connection. So you have pins everywhere. So this is going to be a very similar setup. But for now, let me close these two and focus on the arm, which is a more simple one. So I have arm one and arm two. There is a base, which we're not gonna need actually. And I have the pin here. The uh, base joint is a revolute joint because the arm wants to turn around the first arm as well. This is the elbow. And if you look at it, the elbow has some stuff in driver tab. I'm driving it with harmonic function the sine or cosine function with some amplitude and a speed so the arm is going back and forth and you could have any combination of motion you have in your system and then uh, here I have a fixed joint fixing a pin fixing the base uh, to the first arm and then I have another Sorry, this is fixing the base plate to the ground, to, to the space. So the whole thing is not falling. And the second is pin fix, which is fixing the pin to this highlighted arm. All right. So one, one difference you see here with this and the knuckle joint, the pin and this arm are same. They're, they're together. They're working together because I fixed this to this second arm. So it means that the pin only rotates inside the fork. And uh, it's important to know that because then you know that you don't have to simulate contact inside the eye, inside the central one, but contact is happening on both sides of this fork. And uh, also I have a gap in between here. Uh, no, that I this is a robotic arm. Okay, I have a motor turning this pin. I put a motor here, turn this pin to move that up. So I have to fix the pin to this so I can move it up. That means there is torsion on the pin as well, but we're just gonna go with knuckle joint calculations and only calculate the forces on the pin, regardless of the torque, regardless of the torsion. That's very easy. You can easily calculate torsion in this uh, pin and find out the initial diameter you want to go with it. And uh, if you, I th okay, I have to solve it again. Then I get the result here. If you look at the result, it's just moving back and forth it's just two seconds but if you simulate for more time it just goes and comes back now uh one good thing that you can already use on the joint as we talked before you just click on xy result view here to get all the results you want from bodies and joints if i click on bodies i only see motions down there that i can't read but if i click on joints i also see forces because joints are places that reactions happen. So the software is capturing forces on the joints. And for example, elbow is being uh, driven uh, here. The, the rest of the joints are also, you, you see you have force as well. Now, what is interesting for us is the elbow, this one that is being driven. And Mainly, you see two main categories, which is absolute and relative. 
generally absolute means compared to this reference down here or main coordinate system in Unix, wherever you have. And relative means obviously relative to whatever you, you define on the, the that particular joint. So let's take a look at the elbow. For the elbow, if I click on the origin or the vector, doesn't matter, I just want to have this coordinate. Let me move this away. You see this coordinate here is different than this one, both in direction and in position. That's up there. This is somewhere in the space in NX. And also here, Z axis is toward the axial uh, axis of the pin. Why well, Z axis is upward in general. Secondly, when you're calculating motion, force, rotation, all this stuff, this axis up here, which is relative, is turning with your joint. Well, this is always stationary there. So most of the time, you need to remember that most of the time, we don't care about the absolute. You don't want to have forces or displacement to some reference outside of your system. I want to know how much is the force at this point regarding to a coordinate system on that point not somewhere in this space all right so that's why we go uh, with relative and you can easily read forces here uh, just to make it easier i'm gonna put a marker here that because nx is not unless you double click on the join every time you want to see the direction of the uh, rotation or forces you, then you don't see this coordinate system. So X is downward, Z is toward the axis. I can actually go here and put a marker somewhere with uh, the same. Hopefully I can find the same here. Let me see So I can make that. Z, I think it was like this, right? X was downward or Y? Let me go back and check again. Yeah, so basically this marker is just a uh, annotation for showing what's going on. And maybe I reduce the size a little bit so we can see, yeah. Now we see it better. I mean, why is not obvious, but you see X and Z. Okay, now if I click on elbow, that's just an annotation, okay? It's not doing anything. Although you can use markers in NX for a lot of different stuff. Here, if you go in the top, markers are basically points on objects. So sometimes you don't want to see the overall movement of the part, but you want to see the movement of this corner. Then you put a marker there. Then you can go up here uh, in this tab and use a sensor. You put the sensor on your marker. Here it gives you options. You can capture velocity, displacement, force, or anything you want of that marker. So you can go around, put markers. These are like sensors. And then you have, you can, I mean, this is more complicated, but then you can connect this to the Simulink control that you are making collect data from sensors of your robot or whatever system you have, then you can put motors here. I mean, you make the whole setup. You make the whole setup. You make the control loop in Simulink, then you make the robot here in NX, and you can run everything. And easily, you can make an IMU. If I want to put an IMU here on my robot, I'll put a marker, then I define acceleration sensor here. And you can put X, Y, Z, pitch, yaw, and any angle you want to have and capture. But uh, I'm just putting a marker here just to know what is x, y direction. Going back to the elbow, what we want to do is, I mean, we went far away from this object, but what we want to do is to calculate the pin. So to calculate the pin, I want to know what is the maximum load on it. This is the first step of any calculation or simulation, the loading. 
Now the loading, you might get it from some standards in some applications, for example, for a building like this, the standard says 400 kilogram per meter square. That's called, a, that's called a dead load. Then they say, okay, it's a university, then 400 kilogram per meter square for live load. That means people or stuff that move around. You add it up, that gives you loading. You just put it everywhere. You Not everywhere, but you put the loading on the building and then you calculate it. For, for, for a car, it's not that simple. For a car, you have dynamic loading. Then you have to simulate it somewhere dynamic, dynamically like in motion. Like the excavator I had. Putting the bucket actually down and pushing it up. Or you can have a vehicle simulation uh, here in NX as well. In NX motion, it, it has vehicle simulation. So you just draw the road you uh, model your car and then you model the tires and everything. You just put the car in the uh, road you have, it could be a racetrack or whatever. And then it goes around. Then you pick the suspension and you look at the stress on the suspension. So you can, if it's dynamic, you need to do this, do the motion actually to get the uh, loading. But the load changes. So let's take a look at it. It gives me the uh, force magnitude. I go directly for that. If you double click on the force magnitude and then here and create new window, it gives the magnitude of the force, which means magnitude of X, Y, and Z, right? And of course the force changes uh, because the, let's uh, see the different components. Then we talk about why it changes. This one <clears throat> is X. And it, this is axial, so follow this uh, green one, green coordinate system as our uh, base coordinate system. So X is axial, and then uh, Y uh, is downward, and it's almost zero. And uh, we have Z, which is zero, basically zero. And uh, these are due to some uh, inertial uh, faults in the simulation, which is not a big deal. You can see the orders of magnitude of zero. So we, don't, we can't call it a zero. So here going back, and this uh, fits well with defining a knuckle joint. As I said, knuckle joint cannot carry anything but axial load, which makes total sense. And now we can take a look at, at the change of the load works at, along the axial axis. If you take a look, let me run it slower. So the force is almost constant, but we can, if, if we consider the absolute force, we can consider absolute maximum at somewhere around here somewhere around here. And the reason is actually not a static, it's dynamic. The arm is going back at the point that it wants to come back, you have maximum force here, which makes total sense. I mean, at the start, it starts it slowly goes up, which is a still a uh, very high point, very close, consider these two points. This point is the initial point at here. Yeah, just take the absolute value. I have 15.75 and 16.5 at both ends, right? At this end, it is a stationary, just needs to start moving against gravity. But at this point, it's already accelerating downward. For a shaft first, it needs to, same thing happens to the motor here, right? The motor first needs to slow that down and then go back. So at that point, dynamic load, because if you go with the static load, it's this. It's the weight of this arm on the pin, which is 15.75. But you see dynamic load suddenly increases the whole uh, load, and then you can see that why you, you can't always uh, calculate this stuff statically, like the knuckle joint we didn't calculate, but you can find it on the uh, notes. So it is important to have the loading. Now, what do you do? Uh, is that you usually get the maximum of the chart, but you have to be very careful. If you have contact in your setup, then you might see some spikes. This is because 
uh, as we talked before in simulation, round faces are not actually round. And they go into each other and that is spikes because the software wants to push them away, generates a lot of force to do that in a contact loop. So you see some weird stuff, weird uh, spikes. And you need to be careful. Sometimes you have to refer to the standard to know how much you need to average. But here we don't have contact, so we can rely and say, okay, the maximum is uh, what I'm going to design for. And I think by right-clicking on the chart, we can actually have peak probing mode, which automatically finds the peak at 1.64, which I think is the same as 1.5. And it's 16.5 Newtons. The negative doesn't matter, right? It's just a direction. So here we know that the force uh, along uh, x-axis, which is axial here, is 16.5. Uh, now we uh, go for running simulation. Now, you have multiple options here. The first option we want to do today is that take the loading, extract the loading from dynamic motion in NX motion and take it to NX prepost. The other way is actually the other way around. You get the mesh from prepost and bring it back here into NX motion. That one is more expensive in terms of time that it takes to run the simulation. But if you, if you don't need to see the behavior of the pin all over the time step, then you don't need to bring the mesh here. Because if I bring the mesh here, then it will show me the stresses all over the time steps. On each time step, it's going to run a simple pre-post on every single time step and find the stresses. That takes a lot of time. While I know... The maximum is right at this time step. I don't need to calculate it everywhere else. So I just take this 16.5 and take it to the prepost. To do that, you actually don't need to write down the loads and direction and stuff. The good thing is that these guys actually thought it through and uh, you can't just go to the analysis. And here you have load transfer. And this transfers the load to the uh, prepost. What is asking for is uh, any kind of joint because, as I said, joints uh, carry force. You can select any motion body connected to a joint. So I select this one. I want to extract the loads on the elbow. You can extract the loads on the uh, base as well, but this is going to give you gravity and nothing else. A little bit of moment because of that, but. I don't care for this right now. I just want to focus on the pin. That's good. That's good. See you on the exam. <laughs> what do you mean I don't have it? Did you choose record on solver? No. Yeah. So is that the record on? Right click here. The first you need to go to result and finish. Finish. Open this a little bit so I see the solver name. Okay, it is recording. Uh, go back to analysis. I think you need to finish first until you see it. And then animation player under that arrow. Is it a touch screen? Yeah. Man, I hate your laptop. <laughs> there is an arrow. Yeah, your your yours is set on animation player. Yours looks like this. It's set on animation player. So just click on the arrow. This small arrow here, the drop down opens, and you have more options. And all these options are very useful. This is where you actually can uh, extract a lot of stuff, not just the load from uh, NX motion. For example, you can create a sequence or motion envelope. This means, like, I do a kind of simulation at this point. I want to capture this and take it to my assembly in the NX modeling. Sometimes you want to do that. So, it, because uh, then in NX modeling, at some point, you might want to see if it hits the wall, for example, or not. So, you bring the arm there, you capture the sequence or create a sequence, which means 
your assembly is going to change to this orientation, then you can. But here you only care about the uh, load transfer. Maybe we'll later we cover the rest of them. So the load transfer opens, and uh, then I select a motion body so I can get some. Uh, I need the elbow, so I have to select another motion body that gives me the elbow joint, which is connected to the elbow joint. And then I play. And uh, it starts to connect to Excel. If you're lucky, it connects. If you're not, it says fail to connect to Excel even, get an error, but it doesn't matter. I don't want to see the uh, forces in Excel, OK? Uh, it, that's for if you want to actually save all the forces and times. Anyone had it connecting to Excel? Yeah, everyone, right? Except me. Yeah, I remember I fixed this error, but then I updated and it's all gone. But anyway, you don't need to see it on Excel. It's good to have it, but what happened? Yeah. So uh, here it, it is asking for the time step I want to extract. Obviously, I don't want to extract all time steps. It's going to be useless. I know maximum load is happening at 1.44. To see uh, what is 1.44 in terms of time step, you can use animation player. So uh, I just put it on time. I go to 1.44 or somewhere nearby that has this. Then I go with the step. It's 72. So it's step 72 is what I want to extract. I go back to the load, select the joint I want to do, click play. So it starts to extract result. Also, it tries to connect to Excel for no reason. And uh, then I can actually stop it and say, OK, 72. And then clicking on the plus adds it to uh, what I want to extract as a load. Basically, that's it. But you can also save it down here. You can specify a name. We don't need it, it because it saves it as part of this uh, SIM file. Just click OK. I already did this, so it's asking me to replace that or not. I say, yeah, replace it. Now, every, it, it's going to appear in the uh, motion navigator. Let me go uh, here. Yeah, here. Now you're going to see this load transfer here. And every time. This is a nice thing about NX. So I can go back, run the simulation, find out if the pin is fine. Then come back here, run it again with different loading. It automatically updates this load. Then I can go there again and run the pre-post. So back and forth, you want the, you, you find the best size for the uh, pin or whatever part you have. So we want to find the stress acting on the pin. So far, we could extract the load. This is, you can say, the most important part of any simulation. You, you have the loading. And the way we did it was we did a dynamic motion in NX motion and then extracted the maximum load when it happens on the uh, a step uh, that the maximum load happened. And now it is saved here on the solution. If you check, I have that a specific arm load. You see, it is extracting the load for the arm, which is arm one. But arm one has two joints. So at the end, you're going to see two, one set of load on the top and bottom on each joint being extracted. But we're going to see that in pre-post. So uh, I think we don't have anything else to do here. We can move uh, application and pre-post. And we already did a uh, couple of different. Uh, OK, do you see this? Uh, because it's you can't switch from motion directly to pre-post. You have to go to the modeling assembly mode first. Otherwise, it goes to the gateway mode. So I just right click and open assembly in the window. It figures out this is kind of a bug, I think. It goes to pre-post now. And uh, yeah, I can go to pre-post. So we have uh, the arm here. As as I said before, you have to minimize the time you will want to waste on simulation by minimizing the parts you want to mesh. 
the hand here, I don't want to mesh it. The base here, I don't want to mesh it. So I don't need to add those parts to my simulation. And I want to remove, for example, this mark here and cut. Maybe I cut from here. Why would I mesh the whole arm while I just want to calculate the pin? Doesn't make sense. So I cut it from there. Maybe I also cut somewhere. Else. To do all this stuff, first you need to use this wave link. That makes a copy of your uh, setup wherever you select. I just make a copy. This copy is a 3D copy. It's called the wave link in Unix and puts it in top of the assembly. And so it duplicates it. So when I work on this, the master part is untouched. But it still follows the dimension of the master part. So if I go back in modeling and resize something, it reflects here. If I go here, the parts are still here. Uh, but on the top assembly, you have not three parts on the uh, top assembly. So I can actually hide everything here. And the copied uh, bodies are going to remain. So this is what I'm going to work on. And the parts are already eaten and they're not going to change. It also gives nice tools up here so we can start modifying the part without going to the modeling, for example, by using delete. I can just get rid of this easily. And uh, uh, the important thing is cutting the pin. You know, I'm, I'm going to apply contact and force on the pin. Let me go here and hide uh, this to show the pin. What I want to do is to generate some faces so I have enough face to apply forces or constraint. Because I know the eye is here, so I want to apply the load coming from the eye here at this point, not to everything. So I cut it under it, gives me a face. And it doesn't matter. It's still one part and it's going to mesh together. It just gives me more uh, options to select next if I want to. You can come back here anytime and change the part file and go back to the pre-post. I'm going to use this option, divide face, uh, to technically divide face on the uh, pin. And I want to go... I don't know, maybe the object. Let's see if it works, if I can select this. Yeah, so it cuts. I don't know, let's, let's see if it cuts actually there. Okay, this one doesn't work. Let's go with normal to face. Yeah, this one works. So I can go with normal face and give me a cut where I want. And uh, then I go the other side. Again, select that. Check the result. Result is good. Click apply. So, for now, I'm not going to, because it takes time, I'm not going to cut under the fork as well, but you need to do that because fork contact happens away from this gap. So, you have to cut under the fork as well. So you have two faces for contact with the fork. I'm just going to avoid that. Uh, it takes just more time to simulate, but that's fine. Hopefully, this is going to simulate fast. So I have that. I can also split bodies at any point I want. Or basically, you can actually move faces to make it a smaller. Let me zoom in. Here, you can make it small like this. And same thing, you can cut it from here or simplify it as much as possible. I'm going to stick with the same thing. But uh, when you do it, either you do it optimally or in the exam, just you need to explain why did you mesh everything or is it an option to optimize more or not. These are stuff, even though you all have the same question, but uh, same problem. There are a lot of questions that I'm going to ask that are different. Very much. Like, what? Is it like the the 
Very good argument. Very good argument. Then I will tell you that you could go with a finer mesh on a smaller part to get more accurate results, right? You have a supercomputer. Then actually you have to make it a smaller. You have to cut this part so you can have a very fine mesh here, right? Yeah. <laughs> then you're going to get weird results. Then you have to explain the stress concentration and singularity. You always have to explain something. <laughs> Don't worry. I always find a way to fail you. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Why, why are you scared? That's why we have the censor, right? Oh, he's with me. <laughs> Don't worry. He has been censored for two years. We know each other and he's cool. He's like, yeah, fail that guy. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's very calm. He's very cool. It's okay. Don't worry, guys. I mean, what? Is a guy expert in adhesive bonding from Aarhus? Yeah. What? That guy? No, I don't know. I didn't try. You guys try. <laughs> Why would I bribe him? But you guys try it, maybe. Don't forget me, okay? <laughs> maybe it's a better idea to bribe both, you know? Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. But not many people fail, man. A failure is a joke here. You get second on third time and it doesn't appear in your GPA. I mean, it wasn't like that for me or a lot of people. I mean, you fail, it's in your transcript. And the more you take it, it's actually more embarrassing. <laughs> I get took it 10 times. <laughs> yeah, so don't worry. It might be easier actually second time if you have more time, right? Where were we? <laughs> I forgot about everything. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's simplify it as much as you can <clears throat> or explain that why did you need or you can just say, okay, it was possible to simplify it up to that point. And then we discuss that. Yeah. Would it be okay to just say that simplifying it even more takes more time than just solving it? No. Because then it takes less time to simulate 10 times. Because you're not just simulating once, then you have, a, you have a problem. You go with different load cases, different constraints, and every, one, every time you're going to mesh and it's just stay there for, yeah, doesn't make sense. You simplify it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's get that out of the way. Or you explain how much it, it is possible to simplify this. We may go down to, like, removing everything but, but the pin. Yeah, because I've seen it, that's a very good answer. We go down that road, like may maybe we do, maybe we do. Because it is possible to remove everything but the pin, right? And then you apply constraint on one side that is connected to the fork. Then you apply load on the other side, which is connected to the eye, right? Simple pin. Then as he said, we can't even make that in half because there is a symmetry. Then we do simulation. This is like... You already passed. <laughs> that was it. no. That, it's not that easy. So uh, it's okay. Let's uh, let's continue. Let's assume that I simplified it. I go uh, with the new fem. I don't want idealized part. You can go ahead and select a part, but I go with all visible because uh, I hide everything that I didn't need. And I'm gonna continue a little bit faster. With probably don't have time the rest of options are okay this is exactly same options we did last time and uh, brings up making a solution I'm gonna go with 101 is static you don't create solution what is it giving did you go with uh, pre post or you just now, I click here on the top. Let me see what the solution. Yeah, I think by default it's making 101 for you. Go, uh, you don't even have a solution? Click here. Under, oh, yeah. Um, can you open this so I can see the name? This one? Yeah, open the. 
Yeah, I need to see this later. You have changed some options that are not giving you the. I haven't changed anything. Or okay, then right click and create a new solution. Right click on the top. Go up to the top. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you have create new solution. Okay. I, I, I don't know. Okay, yeah, yeah. Go with that. Yeah. Okay. This is the window here, similar to this. Maybe it's a version different, but I don't think so. It should bring up this window automatically. That's then your problem. <laughs> it's not a general version problem. You didn't have it? No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but if it didn't, it's up here. Solution at the top. You just click on it and bring it up. Because you can make it anytime you want. Okay. So I go with create solution. Last time I talked about some options here. I just want to keep it the way it is. I will come back to the solution and change the option later. And uh, <clears throat> let's start with meshing. We did all this stuff. I mean, I explained meshing and we went through all the uh, mesh analysis, mesh study. So you do all of that. You're not just moving this fast that I'm going. You do a mesh analysis to find the best size of the mesh. But I'm going to go with the default. And uh, when it meshes, it meshes parts differently. And separately so they are not connected as we want it to then either you have to connect them like glue them together or use contact now it's taking more time than usual or did it crash no not yet hopefully not i always get like The only good computer is that one. Yeah, this. OK, uh, you immediately I get this element red, blah, blah, blah. This means uh, there are bad elements in the mesh. So selecting everything and meshing together is not a good idea. Here, you can see it here. Yeah. So NX is telling you that if you already have a bad mesh by making it red. So I go back and change it. Oh, I can remesh it. It will replace the mesh. But this time, I just select them separately and go with the size good for that part. Didn't you get an error? I just hate whatever your, I don't know, your computer. It's computer that's bad. Nah, yeah, OK. OK, it's bad. <laughs> i give you that. OK, now, now, it's, now it's OK. I don't have that. I mesh separately. Hopefully, I don't get any more errors. But if you do, then you have to play with the size of the mesh. There, there are usually problems on the edges with the skewness. You have a very long triangle and very narrow. That's not very good. The NX is uh, checking the quality of the element here on the top. You can click it and see it separately and select them separately. Do fine meshing wherever needed instead of what I did. I did mesh size change overall, mesh size change. You could just focus on that part and fix it. But let's continue. Uh, we want to calculate the pin. So now uh, on the mesh side, I will be back on the mesh side to define 1D connection for the load. But first, let's go activate simulation <clears throat> to activate this uh, bar in the top. And here, I can right click on the top uh, simulation and import motion loads. On the top, find dot .sim file and double click on it. Did you get it? Yeah, now you have it. No, it's already activated. When you, when you get this bar, it's already yeah, activated. Because, because this person, you just yeah, you can use that to switch between. Your NX is from another world, man. I don't know why it's doing that. So uh, you go here, import mesh load. You see on the same path, this is motion. It's a dot sim file, but it says motion because where was that? I don't know where did you simulate. Oh, oh, okay. Right click, right click here, and go to import motion load. Don't tell me you don't have it. <laughs> import motion load. OK. <laughs> and then browse to uh, where you did the motion simulation. 
and click OK. And then you see the ARM1 that we already did. The load is here. Click OK. And uh, this magically brings all the loads that I wanted to apply. So if I just hide the mesh and polygons here, this is the load and the torque. Also, the gravity as a field is here. So this is a very cool part of NX. You don't need to uh, consider uh, gravity for different parts. It automatically brings it based on what material you selected for the uh, in the motion and where it automatically calculates the center of mass and it applies to gravity. So you can see on the join there are a for there is a force downward. This is Fx. You remember x was downward. And then uh, the moment that is being applied. And if I double click on the, one of the forces, I can actually see them again here. You see the full over all the time steps. But if you right click on the force and go to information, this gives you all the information. And it's a good idea that you always check that. It says time index was 72, which is correct. On 1.44, that's what I wanted. And uh, Fx was 15.8, that's correct. Fy, Fz is correct. Everything is correct, so now you can continue. Now you know this is the load that you want to have. I'm going to remove everything else because I don't need them. And they don't have much effect. I mean, if, if the moment, we can check the moment as well, even though... Uh, uh, it's, it's not going to affect anything. So both are X and Y. Because it's a pin, it's not going to carry any load. So I don't need to consider the moments on the pin because the pin is loose and turning. So I'm just going to remove that. So the force I'm going to keep it th is this one. Also gravity, I don't want to have it because it just, it just takes more time to simulate. You can keep everything and run simulation. And, but before before I remove, the other ones are here. Down here under the R. There was a fixed pin here, right? So that's why it is extracting gravity and force here as well. It is extracting every joint for you on that part. But down there, I just want to fix it. I don't want any load there. So just going to keep this force here and remove everything else. Now let's bring back the mesh only for the pin. Or maybe the polygon. Yeah, let's go with polygon only for the pin. The load is somewhere in the space, right? And this CSIS is uh, defined to have, the, we have three of them because there, are, there were three points in the simulation. So uh, if you look, it defined a point there which is not connected anywhere and put the load on it because this is the exactly where I defined the origin for the revolution. But in pre-post, it's not connected anywhere. So first thing you do after bringing the force to pre-post, you connect it where you want. I want it to be connected to this central ring of the pin. So let's do that. I go to meshing, activate meshing. 1D connection. In the top, go with the point to face. My point is this one in the center. And the face, I'm going to bring back the shaft. I'm going to select this face. And I'm going to use one of these rigid body elements. If I use rigid body 2, it's going to make this cylinder rigid. So it's not going to deform. That's not a good idea. The rigid body three, I think we talked about this before, is a flexible rigid body. I mean, it's rigid body, but flexible. <laughs> I I can't explain it later. It, it, it's a little bit complicated, but you can uh, consider it as a very a strong spring. So it's, it, this can be a squeeze the seal, but uh, the force is being transferred. Now, let me show how it looks, then maybe it helps. Here, if I hide this, you see it 
just makes an, a spider connects that point with a spider to every point on that face and you might get a different spider because of the elements you have if i bring back the elements of the mesh there you see i have a coarse mesh so every node now on that cylinder is taking uh one of the legs of the spider so the force is there on the point the spider connects it to the cylinder and that cylinder moves everything wherever you want applies the look if i run the simulation now it's just gonna fail because there is no constraint the pin is just gonna fly away so i have to fix this stuff now now in general they have it fixed here pinned here and it moves up there now i have the force here so i do the opposite i fix on both points and then put the force here you get that these are equal okay you can't fix it here then move that then you get some force here as a result but if you already have a force you don't need to move it anymore you just fix both sides and then put the load here okay i hope that is clear it's a bit weird but uh you can do that and you get the same result to apply constraints you have to activate simulation and then constraint type fix constraint I didn't want to I just want to select that face I need to bring back the polygon and hide the mesh so I select this face and this face and this way I fix and it's already constrained but now the pin is not connected anywhere it just falls down through the mesh so I have to define contact and that's in simulation type surface to surface contact we did this before I select everything it automatically finds the pair I have four pairs which is correct you are so slow man I did that like five minutes ago here this icon you click on this oh I did control a but you can do this just throw a box good some shortcuts on your keyboard helpful uh, you can also uh, define friction coefficient it helps with stabilizing your simulation as well and then I click OK I'm not gonna check anything else but it probably fails let's go and then it's good actually to debug after error so I go with solve yeah and obviously it fails my guess is material yeah no material associated with the mesh we forgot to define material i go back here I activate meshing solid let's go with what we did last time yeah just gonna have this uh 226 megapascal later i have it in the example as well to compare it. so it's gonna be ncs still uh 1005 here i just define the material you can define any material that you want activate simulation and solve again probably phase again but it's not bad to see errors in nx and how you fix them okay brings up okay when you see that loop that loop is the contact loop so it means this stuff are working but let's see if the result is actually reasonable structure first i don't have anything about contacts so remember we have to go back request contact results from uh, solution second <laughs> i is <laughs> doesn't look normal yeah what, what is the problem we discussed this right yeah gaps and overlaps initial gaps and overlaps we, we, we discussed this last time and it's crazy okay this is no you do it on the exam <laughs> of course i'm gonna do it but normally when this deformation is off you're not gonna notice it see there is nothing wrong if i turn off the uh deformation you see any you see nothing wrong and you get a crazy stress 2000 megapascal that's like 
failure. And yeah, so make sure that this is on and on 10%. So you see the formations if they make sense. So this doesn't make sense. The problem is uh, the initial penetration of mesh elements. We have to fix that first. Uh, go back to the solution, right click, edit. And here I have global contact parameters. I could fix the contact I defined here, simulation object contact. Just change that contact to ignore penetration. But if I do it here, it will override all contacts in the simulation. So you can't do one by one. That's why it calls uh, global. So I change it globally so it overrides everything. Initial penetration on the left, and uh, it's always by default on calculate from geometry. I don't know why. It should be by default on set gaps and penetrations to zero. So at the start point, everything just fits perfectly instead of going into each other and generating it as unreal stresses. That's the first problem. The second one was requesting stuff. So output request here. I edit that. Uh, look for contact result. Yeah, it's here. Enable contact. There are a lot of results you can request here. We go through some of them later if you want to request some stuff. So now this is going to capture contact information for me as well. So I think everything is fine now, so let's all begin. Okay, now you see uh, it listed contact traction, contact force, contact movement, pressure. So I can actually check what happened in the contact region. But let's first the first check the stress. Now it makes sense. Now it's uh, in it's behaving correctly. I have a downward force on a pin, so it pushes everything down and it squeezes everything. And this is exaggerated, of course. The stress makes sense given the load we had, like 15 newtons is nothing for this. And that's why the stress, it was 2,000. Now it's one-tenth of a megapascal. And it's going to go down if I find the mesh a little bit. And that's this element of stress. We're going to check that with calculation next time. Another important one is this contact pressure. I'm going to check that exactly for crushing. So here you see how the, uh, I better go back to, turned off the so how the uh, contact looks like on the pin and uh, if it's needed to, to uh, make some changes in the pin to uh, tolerate the contact so uh, that's it for today uh, any question